Now that we've solved problems involving gases that flow past plates, which is um, an isothermal condition and smooth plates, now let's try considering a fluid in which it is in its liquid state or should I say a simple liquid water. Um, I want you to read the problem and then pause this video so you get an understanding of the problem and then just go back here after. Okay, so I hope you've um, read it and understood it and when solving for forced convection or natural convection or any kind of convection, there's just these three main rules that I've already mentioned. So the first one would be the identification, I mean the, the termina determining of our condition. So in this case, what we have here is liquid water in a smooth tube. So if we would represent this as something like a bounded boundary layer, what you will be getting is something like this line. And assuming that's the upper boundary of that tube and then this one is the second layer of that boundary i mean the second boundary of our tube so this is the tube and then of course the fluid will come in so it comes through this let's just use something like this just to visualize the different layers of the fluid and as you can see the streams would be would be forming something like a parabolic um in nature or the velocity profile so the fluid enters and then as you can see here the inlet let's use another color so the inlet temperature is actually equal to 60 degrees fahrenheit and then the fluid comes out so the fluid comes out here and then the temperature on the out i mean the final temperature of our fluid, that is the outlet temperature, that is equal to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And the tube has an electric heat that will provide the constant heat flux. So the temperature at the wall, so we say that the temperature at the wall is always 30 degrees, but not 30 degrees Fahrenheit, but 30 degrees above the water bulk temperature. So in this case, it is always 30 degrees above the bulk temperature so the surface temperature is higher than our temperature of the at the bulk condition of water it also says here that the Reynolds number is equal to 100,000 and that we need to find the length of the tube given that our diameter is equal to 0 0.5 centimeter now, I would want to take note of this bulk temperature. The bulk temperature is simply the average of our inlet and outlet. So remember, we used to describe something like a film temperature when we solved um, gaseous phase of fluid. So that simply means that we take the temperature to the surface and then the free velocity temperature. So in this case, we're referring to the bulk temperature, which is not the... It is not the... Uh, what they call this it is not the film temperature but the bulk temperature which is the average of the inlet and the outlet so don't get confused with that term okay so basically when we're dealing with liquids we're talking about the bulk temperature and if it is not stated there that there's this kind of bulk temperature we would we would always assume that the velocity or the uniform flow he flow here would give us already the bulk temperature if it's not stated here that um, liquid water that mean the water would be heating from a certain temperature to a certain temperature so let's have some bulk here let's have 30 plus I mean 60 sorry 60 plus 120 and then divide this by 2 so that we get the average so the average here would be 90 degrees Fahrenheit so the 90 degrees Fahrenheit is our, is our bulk temperature and if you would like to consider our TS, if you wanted to like um, still determine TS for our um, future solving, then we have 30 plus 90, then we get 120. So therefore, our surface temperature, that is the surface at the surface, I mean the temperature at the surface of the cylinder. So we have 120 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So these two are the most important, I mean, temperatures here, the bulk and the surface temperature. We are already given with the Reynolds number. So with that, if we want to analyze the condition, what we have here is a smooth, the smooth pipe. And of course, this is um, cylinder and the flow here is internal. So that's the case. And then we have a Reynolds number that is 100,000. So remember, if we have a Reynolds number that is greater than 4,000, then the flow is turbulent. So we already have the condition smooth pipe or the cylinder and then turbulent. So with that, with this condition, let's go back with the Ferris handbook and locate which could be the most appropriate equation to be used. So you go on chapter 5, heat, tran heat and mass transfer. We're lucky to have the Reynolds number since it lessens our computation regarding these properties. Let's try force convection and then this round tubes. So we have here a lot of discussions. You can also read this if you want. And then this is the most important thing here. It says here that for constant wall temperature, a fully developed laminar velocity. So this for laminar, and this is the simplified one. But in here, we also have the fully developed flow in the transition region between laminar and turbulent flow and for fully developed turbulent flow. So this is our main concern. And for fully developed turbulent flow, that's why we'll be using this equation that we have here. And it says here that you can use this if we have a parallel number that is point greater than 0.5 and less than 10 to the 5th. And then the Reynolds number is less than 10 to the 6th, in which case we have actually 10 to the 5th. So it satisfies this Reynolds number. And then K, which is the ratio of the parallel number at the bulk temperature and then the surface temperature raised to 0.11. So for liquids, which is in case we have that liquid, Brandon number based on evaluation should be less than 20 but greater than 0 0.05. So there's a lot of condition and we need to satisfy all of that so that we can use it. So we already have this kind of equation for the Nassalt. And by the way, we need to find this Nassalt number. Well, simply because if the problem asks us, uh, this problem asks us about the length of the tube. So remember, if we're talking about the length of the tube, we could take that from our Q being equal to A, H, and then TS minus TE. Or we could replace this TE with TB. And if this is Q, we could also say that uh, this is equal to the mass flow rate and then the specific capacity of the fluid at the bulk temperature. And then we multiply this with the change in our temperature that is delta t so we will get a h and then t s minus t e and then the area here would represent the area that is in contact with the fluid so that is 2 pi r l or it could be that pi um, d l so what we have here is the l and then we'll be getting that from this equation so that's how it goes for this one and to obtain that, we need to find the value of H, which will be coming from this Nassalt number. So at first, we need to find H so that we can proceed with our final equation here. So with that, let's have some review first of this equation that we have, that we'll be using. So we don't have any problem with the Reynolds number that is evaluated at the diameter, and we're already given with that. That's one hundred thousand. So that's all. So what we need here is the Prandtl number, and the Prandtl number could be evaluated based on these, um, what we call the bulk temperature. So what we have here is the new variables F and then K. So F, based on Paris Handbook, it says here that you can use the finding friction factor given by this kind of equation, and that is only true for the. So we'll be using this for our case, and let's check if it can it can satisfy our. Um, equation it says that f is this equation and then the Reynolds number should be around this value and it satisfies since remember this Reynolds number is around 1 to the fifth okay and then k so going back with that equation k is actually equal to this one so that is our equation for k 
we just have to take the ratio of our prandtl number at the bulk and then the surface temperature and raise it to 0.11. And the condition states that for liquids, it should be that this should be the values that we'll be getting. Since deviation may occur from, I mean, not satisfying all these conditions. So first, since we're already given with the Reynolds number, let's try solving for the fanning friction factor first since, you know, this is already can easily be solved. You know, um, I used to, th to solve uh, this kind of equations in momentum transfer before. I used to have some kind of graph and in the, la in the latter part, I also used some kind of equation and I, wa I wasn't using the graph anymore because, you know, graphs in momentum transfer are really annoying and they are really um, difficult to, I mean, for me, it's difficult to read. So, I would have to resort on using equations rather than, you know, looking at the graph. And I would also suggest you to, to do that since these, cor these correlations are already proven and they are more effective in solving since you can give the exact value and, uh, I mean, the values are more exact than just by looking at the graph. So have the habit of using correlations instead of graphs especially when you have already given with the correlations. That's the use of Ferris Handbook. So, anyway, since this is not momentum transfer, this is heat transfer. So, I'll just be using this finding friction factor. So, I'll be substituting the Reynolds number and probably I'll be getting some value of the finding friction factor. And you can always check this value at a graph that we have somewhere at chapter um, 10, I think. So, there, if you calculate for F, we will be getting a value that is around 4.498 times 10 to the negative 3. So, this is the finding friction factor. If you use graph, you would be saying that oh, the value should be around 0 0.004 and you will not be getting this 0.498. So, I mean, it's a lot better to use an equation than just by looking at the graph. Now let's try solving for um, k first. And before we can do that, we need to find all the properties at this bulk and surface temperature. So with that, we need to solve for our PR at the bulk temperature and then PR at our surface temperature. They will be using the same equation Cp mu over k, wherein it, it, this one is evaluated at the bulk and this one is evaluated at the surface. So let's try doing this. For our um, bulk specific heat capacity, we should go back to our thermodynamic properties of water that's around, um, so that's chapter two. And then I think that's table two dash uh, 413, I think. So let's check, yes. So this table 2-413, they will be giving you a lot of properties here. And there's a lot. Now you can see it. So we have temperature to viscosity just like the oxygen we have had before. And we need to find the temperature at which it is 20 de I mean 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So by conversion of that um, value, since this is in Kelvin, so let's just have here... Um, the bulk temperature at that's 90 degrees Fahrenheit and using Kelvin what we'll be getting is a value of 305.3722 Kelvin and for our surface temperature that is 120 degrees Fahrenheit you'll be getting 322.0389 Kelvin so we'll be using this to interpolate the values of our um, there's handbook. And since this is, we always as assume that liquid is saturated. So we check on this property here, the saturated properties. And the first one would be the liquids. And this will be followed by the vapor, I mean vapor water, water vapor, sorry. So in this case, I'll be interpolating in between values of 305 and 322. So I'll be interpolating at this region first. So that's 300, 
300 to 310 and I'll be interpreting interpolating in between those values and and after that I will be able to get the values at the bulk temperature so the specific heat capacity at the bulk is equal to 4183.6685 that's joule per kilogram Kelvin and then the bulk viscosity which is dynamic that that is equal to 7.6772 times 10 to the negative 4 pascal second and lastly the thermal conductivity at the bulk is equal to 0 0.6188 watts per meter kelvin now i'll be doing the same for the the condition at our surface temperature and surface is around 320 so i'll be interpolating in between this 320 and 330 so with that the answer would be these values cp at our surface temperature that is equal to 4184.9121 that's joule per kilogram kelvin and then we have the specific i mean the viscosity at the surface temperature that is equal to 5.51, I mean, 5.5917 times 10 to the negative 4, that's Pascal second. And then the thermal conductivity at the surface temperature, that is 0 0.6420. And remember, water at this temperature would, would give you some 0.6 values of thermal conductivity unlike the gases that would give you something like 0 0.02 thermal conductivity so anyway so we can now solve for the bulk prandtl number so the bulk prandtl number would simply be 4183.6685 we multiply that with our viscosity that is 7.6772 times 10 to the negative 4 and then divide it by our k which is 0 0.61 Eight, eight. So the Prandtl number would be equal to 5.1905 and it's dimensionless. And the same thing goes for our Prandtl number at the bulk, I mean the surface temperature. So you have there the 4184.9121 times 5. 0.5917 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by 0 0.6420 and the surface Prandtl number would be equal to 3.6450 so at first we need to check on our k since we have a condition that says here that the ratio would be in between these values so we check on our k that is i mean we check on our pr b over pr of s that is equal to 5.1905 divided by 3.6450 so the answer here is equal to 1.42 Four, zero. So the ratio for our bulk and the surface would be 1.4. Based on this condition, we could see that we satisfy the domain of our ratio. And then let's solve for K. So with that, we take this ratio. So that's, um, I'll be writing, just writing that again. And then raise this to 0 0.11 since that's the formula of our case. So remember, we have, we need to like, sorry. Um, we need to take the ratio from this. Where's that? We need to take the ratio and then raise it to 0 0.11. So we'll be able to find the value of k. So raising that to 0 0.11 would give us the value of our k that is 
three nine six. Okay, so we already have k. We already have the values of our Prandtl number at the bulk surface, and then we also have this finding friction factor. So all we have to do now is substitute all these values at our NASOP. So I think I'll be um, taking this at the lower portion so that I won't get misled by the values. So that's it. And substitute all these values to the nasal number. So we get nasal number at diameter. So we're considering diameter now since it's not x, it's d since it's a pipe and internal flow. So f over 2 would be simply defining friction factor. All we have is 4.498 times 10 to the negative 3 then divide by 2 then multiply that with the term that is the Reynolds number that is 100,000 and then minus 1,000 and then multiplied that's multiplied with our Prandtl number and the Prandtl, Prandtl number that we'll be using is the one that is at the bulk so that's 5.1905 and if you'll be asking why is it at the bulk well, simply because we're considering the fluid here. And the fluid here, it is more evident to use the bulk rather than the surface since we're talking about the fluid properties here. Now, let's proceed with the denominator. We have 1 plus 12.7. This 12.7 will be multiplied to f over 2. That's 4.498 times 10 to the negative 3 over 2. And then we raise that to one half or the square root of that. And then multiply this with the Prandtl number again. But this Prandtl number is raised to a certain rational exponent. That's two thirds and then minus one. And then multiply this with our k. That's 1.0396. So we need to determine the value of our Nusselt number. And the Nusselt number would be equal to 545. 3, 0, 1, 2. And that is dimensionless. Now this is equal to our HT over K, where our H is actually the one that we need, and then this is the diameter. So we have 0 0.5, and then we need to convert this to meters. So that's it for our conversion. And then K, we'll be using the one that is at the bulk. So that's 0 0.6188. And then the unit we want per meter Kelvin. So upon doing your mathematics, we'll be getting a value of our h that is equal to 67,486.5504 and the unit will be watts per meter squared Kelvin. So this is a lot of um, thermal, I mean convective heat transfer coefficient but that is to be expected since we're conducting a fluid inside a pipe. Now let's move on with finding length because that's the question here. Now we need to go back with our equation. So we have Q is equal to A and then H TS minus TB. Well apparently this TB is the free stream velocity we used before as T. So remember this area is the area in contact with the fluid and that is equal to 2 pi RL. Or we could say that this is pi dl. So with that, let's just use that pi dl. So we have pi and then dl. And then we have h and then ts minus tb. Now we're only left with this l. So we can now take l from that. And then that is q divided by this pi. And then the diameter, the convective heat transfer coefficient, and then ts minus tb. So what about q? So we can get Q from the change in the temperature of water that is being conducted at that of that pipe. So since there's a change in temperature, then of course they will, they will have this some kind of Q, and that is equal to the this expression, the Q that is contributed by the water. So we have this general equation of heat that is m c p and delta t, and since we're considering the bulk here, so we have to take the specific capacity at the bulk temperature. And then we have this pi dh and then ds minus db. Now, since 
n since we don't have this mass flow rate but remember this mass flow rate is actually equal to our volumetric flow rate times the density in which our volumetric flow rate is simply the velocity of the fluid times the area of the diameter i mean the area of the cross section of the pipe and then multiply with the density so if you relate this to our reynolds number if you rem remember reynolds number is given as d v rho over mu so if we plug in the reynolds number using this v and then the density what we'll have is simply the reynolds number multiplied with our viscosity that is i mean divided by our diameter that will be equal to our velocity times density and since from this equation what we be getting is that the mass flow rate divided by the area is actually the velocity times our um, density here so this is also equal to our mass flow rate divided by the area and remember area here it stands for the cross-sectional area of the pipe so we can substitute that with our um, equation for our area of the pipe that is simply equal to pi d squared over 4. By the way, this d is the same as this d. Okay, I just use a capital one here, fortunately. So we multiply this, so what we get is the mass flow rate that is equal to pi over 4, and then that is d squared, but 1d will be cancelled out, so I am left with d, and then that is the Reynolds number times the viscosity. So I can substitute this with the equation that is here. So we have pi over 4 and then the diameter we have d and then the Reynolds number and then the viscosity times the specific heat capacitor at the bulk and then this delta t would be t o minus t i or t i minus t o depends and then pi let's just use the capital D and then h t s minus t b. So now since we've already written all of this, we can now cancel um, things out like this pi here and then this d here. So we're now left with L that is one-fourth of the Reynolds number multiplied with our viscosity and then the specific heat capacity at the bulk and then the change in temperature for our fluid. And then we divide this all by the um, convective heat transfer coefficient and then the surface minus the bulk so we just have to like substitute all of these values so what we get is one fourth and then the Reynolds number is 100,000 and this and then the viscosity which is at the bulk that is simply equal to 7.677 to the, to the negative 4 and then we need to take the specific capacity at the bulk so that's 4183 0.6685 and then this TO minus TI that's 120 degrees Fahrenheit minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit but remember this is in Fahrenheit so I need to take that in the SI unit so I should divide this by 1.8 and then divide all of these by the H that we've already obtained and H here is actually equal to 67486.5504 so we get 6 seven four eight six point five five zero four and then multiply this with the change in temperature that is 120 degrees fahrenheit minus the bulk that is 90 degrees fahrenheit and then also the factor for conversion so what we'll be getting here is the value of our l and that is equal to 2.3796 meters so this is the length of the pipe that that it need that the problem needs in order to like um, conduct electricity so or to deliver that specific heat just to change the temperature to 120 degrees fahrenheit so this is one quite long solution that we have here but you know it's just a matter of finding the values of our physical properties evaluating the condition in which we need to take all of this condition and then use the proper equation and that's it so remember what's important here is to determine the condition and you'll just have to like um, go on the same steps that you'll be substituting all of these values and we we do have something like a simplified equation here um, if you could remember this cedar and tape they give 
they gave another equation in which it's a lot simpler and if you would be solving that what you'll be getting is a value that is 2.6553 meters and well compared to this um, it's just around it's around 0.3 meter difference and 0.3 meter difference is is I mean if you want to convert it in centimeter that's 30 centimeter and um, that's like still a lot so as much as possible I wanted you to use this since this is the more accurate and the more preferred one in solving for this but um, during board exam I have to tell you this that when we have something like board exam and then we've identified that the problem is something like a natural or forced convection it's like an auto skip item then you go back to that after you've solved the easier ones and then go back and then you'll be using the more simplified equations rather than those correlations that are very I mean tedious to do this one is already a tedious one but I wanted you to understand how this correlation works because it is written there just I mean to guide you and it's not just for display so okay so yeah thank you and I hope you've understood this very long discussion about force convection next time we will be solving for natural convection and I hope this is much simpler since I still think that this is more I mean simpler than the force convection one so after this we already I mean this force convection we've already done one of the most difficult topics in heat transfer and so yeah that's just being careful and thank you